Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Gavin. I'm from New Relic. And today we want to talk about um, how we went open source with our, our instrumentation, which was kind of a, a pretty big thing for us and like a, a pretty big lift for us to do. And we wanted to talk about it and kind of share our experience and hopefully it'd be helpful to somebody else. And frankly, I think it's just kind of an interesting story anyway. So I have to put this up because we always have to put this up. Just the safe harbor. Basically, nothing I'm saying here indicates anything or tells you anything about future performance. Don't invest based off the stuff that I'm saying here today. Uh, is more or less what this says. But I'll leave this up here just for a second um, so you guys can take a look at it real quick. Okay, let's move along. So um, I want to start out by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Gavin Johnson. Uh, I'm the product marketer at New Relic for all things open source that we do. Uh, prior to New Relic, I was a product marketer at AT&T, working on their video products. Um, notably, AT&T TV, the little box that you can get streaming video on in your house. I was a product marketer on that, um, as well as the relaunch of DirecTV Now, uh, a little bit on the DirecTV like digital applications and some of their AT&T Uber's TV stuff as well. So really a lot of AT&T video products before New Relic. Uh, and then before AT&T, I was at Deloitte. I was a tech consultant as a manager over there. So I managed big tech projects. Um, the one that I did the most or spent the most time doing, I spent about two years at Fox Studios. Uh, you know, the, the studio that was bought by Disney, um, helping them build their theatrical release planning system. Uh, and then before that, I was in business school at University of Southern California. And before that, I was a, a sysadmin. Before that, I was a dev. And to start my career off, I got a, a BS in computer science from Oregon State. So ex-dev turned into a marketer and I do product marketing for tech companies now. So this whole talks about how New Relic open sourced our instrumentation, um, the code and the culture of it, what, what went into it. So to give you context around that, I kind of want to describe what our instrumentation is to give you an idea of like the, the amount of software that we were open sourcing. Uh, so really when you think about New Relic's product, there, there's kind of three layers to it. Um, and there's, it's, this isn't necessarily lined out the way, way we build or anything like that. There's three layers of the way the software works. Uh, one's the instrumentation. So for us, it's our agents and our integrations. It's how you send data from your applications or your infrastructure into New Relic. So that's, that's one piece. The second piece is the data platform, where that data actually goes, where it gets stored, and where you can operate on it. Uh, and then the third piece is analysis and visualization. Uh, and you could say there's a fourth piece around applied intelligence too. Um, and I think that will grow more and more like apparent as things go on. But really, there's kind of three layers right now. So what we're talking about is the instrumentation layer. That is about a third of the software that we had. Um, and what we did here is on April 30th uh, of this year, Bill Staples, our chief product officer, uh, announced internally that we were gonna be open sourcing all of that instrumentation, um, all of it. You know, We had spent hundreds and thousands of hours building this instrumentation out, uh, building out our agents, our integrations, our SDKs, um, our CLI, and we were gonna open source all of it. And we were gonna do it to align with uh, a big launch that we had three months later. So we had three months to open source about a third of the software that we write. Uh, so that's a pretty steep ask and that's how we got, that, that was the set to the story. So that's what we're gonna do and I'm gonna walk you through how we did it. But before that, I kinda wanna talk about why we, we decided to do this. Cause the why is extremely important too. Um, you know, you don't just decide to open source your software. Usually it doesn't just come out of nowhere. So kind of the reasoning behind this is relatively simple. Um, our instrumentation team, the team that builds all of our instrumentation, our agents, our integrations, um, their goal, their mission statement is to enable every engineer in the world to gather complete telemetry about their digital systems. Uh, when you look at open telemetry, which is one of these key CNCF projects right now, uh, it shares basically the same goal. Uh, and, you know, we, we, noticed, we noticed that, like we've been a contributor to it. We've been contributing to open telemetry for over a year. Uh, we're the number three contributor in the last quarter, number six in the last year. Like we're heavily involved in it already. Uh, and we can see that that's where instrumentation is going. It's gonna be based off of open telemetry code, open telemetry standards. Um, and we're gonna align with that. And that was a decision that we made that we, that we felt we needed to make uh, to really get towards and make our mission more likely to be successful to enable every engineer to gather complete telemetry about their digital systems we need to be making our instrumentation in the same way that the po most popular standards are. So we're gonna be making our future instrumentation downstream from the Open Telemetry Project and the Prometheus Project. Um, so we're still developing and supporting our current agents, uh, but as these CNCF standards mature, 
uh, that become more generally available. More and more of our instrumentation will implement the open telemetry and Prometheus standards and be built downstream from those projects. So that was the choice that we made, a strategic choice that we, we need to do as a company. Um, and part of that, because these projects are open source projects, open telemetry and Prometheus, is that we can't work in the closed while we're working on these open source projects. Like we have to be working open source. Um, so that's why we're making our agents open sources. That's why we decided to make them open source. And you know, this wasn't the, the first time that we had done this really. Like we had done some of this before. Um, our Elixir agent and our Roku agent were both launched as open source projects. Um, and we've had stuff that's been code available forever. So like even our Node.js agent, which is pretty popular and our Ruby agent, which is very popular, both been code available. Um, it is weren't under an open source license. Uh, and also like just looking back, like as far back as 2012, probably further, um, we've been open sourcing parts of our instrumentation software, maybe not our agents directly, but other pieces that help enable them. Um, and we've been contributing to open telemetry for over a year. So open source wasn't a new thing. This wasn't new to us, uh, but it wasn't something that every engineer was doing. It was a, a major change for a vast majority of our instrumentation team's engineers. You know, they weren't work, working on open source projects. They weren't working with open telemetry or Prometheus. Um, they were working on private proprietary software with private proprietary tooling for the most part. Uh, so just thinking about that, like the way that you build your code in a private proprietary environment is very different than the way you build it in an open source environment. Um, the way that you maybe comment and document your code is different. Maybe even the way that you just write your code, frankly, is different when it has that public view and that public scrutiny as opposed to being private. So there are a lot of changes just in that um, approach alone and just the way that, that our engineers needed to write their code. But in addition to that, like we also know that for this to actually work, for us to actually get any, any lift off of this, like we need to be a little bit more community oriented, community friendly. Um, and we need to be more of an open source partner instead of being just a company that drops open source code um, on, the, on the people that, that may or may not use it. You know? and, to, and to be that partner, to really work with these projects well, to integrate with them well, um, we needed to transform the way that we created and maintained all of our instrumentation. I mean, just straight down to it. Um, we couldn't keep doing the same things and hope for different results. So we needed to change the way we were doing things to align with what we were gonna do. And that is the reason that July 30th date was set. They decided this couldn't be a quick thing, or this couldn't be a slow thing. It's gonna be a thing that takes months or years. It needed to happen quick, or else it was gonna be painful to make this transition from private and proprietary to open source. Um, and that's one of the big reasons that three month deadline was set, to really light a fire under this team, right? And in that three month deadline, really the work that was gonna be done was open sourcing all of our most popular proprietary agents integrations and SDKs. So this wouldn't be all of them because some of them really aren't in a, in a state to be to be open source, they need some work to get there. They use a lot of third party libraries and stuff like that that, that would need to be rebuilt. But our most popular ones, especially like APM and infrastructure agents could all be, all be ready in this timeline. So that was the goal to open source all of the most popular agents integrations and our SDKs. And the reason that we set that July 30th date was because we were completely shifting the way the new Relic was, was packaged and sold. Um, we were making it more friendly. I think we went from like 12 SKUs or something like that down to three, just making it simpler and easier to understand and really putting the, the way that you spend your money, the way you pay for New Relic, where the value you get out of it is. Um, so that, that was the, the big reason for pushing it towards this date. Not only did it align well with that date and you know having a big announcement and getting you know some notice behind it, but even beyond that, it was complimentary to this. Um, now you can really just buy our telemetry data platform straight and just ingest data into it and use open source tools to set it in. So us open sourcing our agents aligned really well with that change. And we wanted to make sure that it launched with that change. So it wasn't like a big hangover afterwards. They're like, cool, I can ingest into your data platform, but I don't really have anything open source to do it with. It's a little tricky. I still have to use your old agents. Like it's, it, we just wanted to make it simple and we wanted to line that story up. So that date was set uh, and that's what we pushed towards. So this is awesome, right? This is great. There's a ton of amazing work that anybody can use uh, or build on now. And it's available. You can go to opensource.newrelic.com and see all of our instrumentation that we've open sourced. It's a ton, right? And that's determined, right? We can't wait on this. The longer we wait, the greater the pain's going to be. And this matters to our business, so we need to do it now. We can't waste time.
And that seems, you know, a little inspiring, right? Like the, the, the right thing to do for business now, for a lot of businesses, for a lot of these tech companies is to open source parts of their products, to open source parts of their software. Like that is where their competitive advantage lies is having the access to it, having people, to, people be able to build with it and build off of it. It's inspiring, right? We're a big company. We're, we're pushing people to do this. Like that's awesome. But that's not easy. It's hard. It's difficult to do. Like you don't do something like this overnight. Like there's an enormous, enormous amount of code preparation uh, that goes into this. And it kind of breaks down um, into a ton of tasks, but you can loosely group it into like three. Uh, and one was making sure that we weren't using any third party non-open source libraries. So, you know, we can't open source code that uses other code that isn't open source. It doesn't work with the licensing models. So we had to go through and do that. And part of that was do, using like code scanners, um, but other parts of that was actually going through and like having to rewrite uh, libraries or pieces of software that were third party that we couldn't use in an open source agent. Uh, we also had to update as much as reasonable of our, our commenting and documentation because um, standards vary over time and we want it to be standardized and easy for people to use and understand how they would need to uh, document and uh, comment if they built on top of our platform or with our platform. Uh, and then lastly is just code cleanup, right? A lot and making sure that your code's not messy, making sure it runs well, making sure it's like built in a way that makes sense for an open source project. Um, really just getting it ready for the world to use. Uh, and the instrumentation team took all of this on with this aggressive timeline, which wasn't an impossible ask, but it's, it's a difficult one. That's a lot of work for a three month timeline, but they took that on. Uh, but even more than that, um, a lot of us here, especially a lot of the leadership here, understands that making this leap from closed proprietary culture to an open culture can, can be make or break for a business, right? Um, if you don't do it well, it, it's kind of the difference between you being innovative or becoming irrelevant. Um, if you go open source and or a bad open source company, then you're not really an open source company, right? So uh, to really get any of the benefits that we expect to have out of it, to get some community engagement, um, to get people working with and better using our instrumentation, uh, by open sourcing it, we'd have to adopt an open culture as well. Um, and there's a lot to that. You know, we have to change the way that we handle issues and feature requests. Uh, we have to change the way we deal with customer escalations. We have to change the security within and around our products. Um, we have to change engineer work tracking, frankly, right? Just the way engineers do their code uh, or track their work. We have to change the development process itself because the way you develop an open source is different than in a closed uh, proprietary environment. And frankly, we have to change the hiring profile. Right? Everything about the way we built, maintained, and supported our instrumentation had to change. So uh, the leadership and the instrumentation team put together a, a project team um, of people that were purposely selected to help do this well. Uh, and they called this team the Open by Default team, the Open by Default project. Uh, and the leaders of this project were Shar Creeden. She's a director in our software engineering group. She's uh, basically the director of our, our instrumentation team. She's responsible for all the instrumentation engineering teams, making sure they operate well, uh, make sure they produce what, what they need to produce. Uh, next was Melissa Klein. She is our open source program manager. Uh, from our open source program office, uh, we have one of those. And Melissa has a ton of open source experience. She was the open source program manager at IBM for 15 years prior to me, really. Uh, and then lastly was Ben Evans. Uh, and if you have heard of Ben before, it's probably because he's, he's one of like the Java people. Um, he's been involved in open source projects, frequently in leadership positions for about 20 years, if not longer. Uh, he's been involved in creating Java standards for many, many years. He is literally the author of the Java book, Java in a Nutshell from O'Reilly. Like he's, he's the Java guy and, and he works for New Relic and, and we knew that his experience um, would help us go open source and adopt an open culture better. Uh, and that's how the open by default project started with these three. And the open by default project, they, they developed four guiding principles that they wanted our engineers to, to really focus on and work with. And the first one is open by default. And this is very simply any new software that the instrumentation team builds will be open source by default. Uh, the amount of work that the teams do in non open source repositories will over time decrease to a minimum. Uh, and just doing this requires a major shift in thinking. It goes beyond code, it includes transitioning into workflows where things like project governance or design decisions take place in the open instead of behind closed doors like they did currently. Uh, 
Uh, the second thing is go where the engineers are. So unless there is genuinely no existing community to fit the purpose, uh, New Relic will contribute to, or New Relic won't build a community. Uh, and frankly, it, simply what we're saying there is, you know, if there is already a project out there doing what we're trying to do or doing, working towards the goal that we're working towards, we're not gonna fire up a new project and try to get people to come and work on ours. If there's a community where people communicate around the projects that we're on, we're gonna go there. We're gonna go work on their projects. We're not gonna bring them into us if we don't have to. We're only gonna bring people in as a last resort if there's absolutely nothing available that fits the need. The third is do the work. So, uh, you know, while we expected that a lot of, and still do expect that a lot of, a lot of our contributions will come in, in leadership areas in some of these projects, um, we wanted to not emphasize that or focus in on like trying to be leaders of these project get leadership positions, really just showing up and doing the work. Um, we know that a lot of the work that needs to be done in projects like open telemetry isn't leadership. It's just writing the code. It's doing, doing the work that needs to be done. Um, and we'll show up and we're going to do the work. And that's, that's one of the, the guiding principles behind what we're doing. Uh, and we're going to be seen doing it. And like our belief is that those leadership positions will, will follow as, as suited um, based off of the work that we do. So we're, we're about doing the work, not about trying to drive the boat all the time. Uh, and then lastly, we, our contributions are visible. So not only are they visible in the projects that we work on, but we needed to, as an organization, um, and the engineering team, and frankly, outside the engineering team, talk more about what we do with open source and open standards projects. We need people from our engineering team to be willing to you know, do more talks at conferences like this one, which is why you saw Michael Lang a few minutes ago um, do a chat on Ruby uh, and changing over to GitHub Actions, which is one of the major things this, this instrumentation team did um, in this project. You know, that getting people going out there and talking more about what we do, making sure that we write more stories about what we do. Um, and open source and making sure that it's, it's clearly known to our customers that you can find open source at New Relic. Like if you want good open source monitoring software and instrumentation, you can come to New Relic for that. Uh, so those are the four guiding principles that the team had. And they produced one big guidebook, I guess to get away, but it's not a big guidebook. They produced one really key piece of content, I'll call it. Um, for our instrumentation team, and frankly, for a lot of our other supporting teams around the instrumentation team. Uh, and this was called the Open by Default Transformation Guidebook. It was simple. It's nothing complicated. It was, it was a, a Google Doc, basically, with link offs to a bunch of other policy documents that this team had built and was collaborating on across the instrumentation team. Uh, and those documents are the ones listed on the screen. Um, it's basically just a library. It was a one-stop shop to go to like figure out if I need to comment on something, if I wanna give feedback on a process that's gonna be put in place, um, or if I need to know the process so I can start implementing it, this is where I go. And the primary function of it is to communicate information efficient, efficiently and provide you know, mechanisms for collaboration and feedback. That, that's really all this was for. Uh, but it did a lot of things really well. And the things that it did really well was it made it very clear what we were changing and what people needed to change by going off and being able to look at the specific details and conversation um, had within the team around that. So the areas that the Open by Default Transformation Guidebook addressed are issue lifecycle management. Um, historically, we defined our issue lifecycle process on a per team basis, more or less. So different agent teams had different, slightly different processes for issue lifecycle. Uh, the Open by Default project decided to standardize these across teams. Um, and the big notable change here, and, and Michael and his presentation references as well, is that there was a change over to GitHub. So we changed our issue tracking um, system over to GitHub issues. We previously were in a private JIRA. Um, so we, we moved over to GitHub issues to make it easier for people working in the open source community, people working around our projects that want to contribute to our projects to make it easier for them. Um, we also just adopted a lot of other um, GitHub processes as well. Uh, we, like Michael talked about, we, we adopted GitHub Actions for our CI/CD, um, but we didn't really drive process and policy around a lot of them outside of GitHub issues and GitHub projects. And we'll go into that a little bit later too. So we moved our issue lifecycle management over to GitHub. Um, our feature request process also moved over to GitHub. So uh, the existing feature request process had three entry points through our product roadmap software, through account teams, and through uh, our support channels. Uh, the Open by Default team decided that we didn't really want to get rid of any of those because those teams were used to them. They already worked in them. It was mainly change the, the endpoint. So for account teams and our support channels, um, 
instead of Jira going into GitHub issues and filing a feature request there. Uh, for customers in our product roadmap software directly, um, for them, they can still enter in the product roadmap software. We implement an integration between the two that syncs them across. And all of the issues are managed in GitHub issues in the public, but some do come down from our product uh, roadmap software into GitHub issues. Uh, and then are synced back when appropriate. Public roadmaps. This is the, uh, the other piece of moving to GitHub that we had to put some policy around. So currently, like I mentioned, we had you know, a product roadmap software that our customers could access to see where things stood and when things were coming from our products. We decided that because we were moving our issues and our feature requests and our CICD and basically all of our repositories that weren't there already, although I think almost all of them weren't to GitHub, they would make sense to move to GitHub public roadmaps as well. Uh, and to do that, we had, the, or we were going to implement GitHub projects. Um, just frankly, in the time frame that we were working with, we couldn't move to GitHub projects during uh, or for this launch. We had to. We're, we're still working on that right now. Um, but we, we instead we decided to split it into kind of two phases. So the early phase, we put a roadmap markdown file at the top level of of all of our repos that would include a roadmap, and then in the future we'd move to GitHub projects uh, and start tracking our projects with a, a regular roadmap via GitHub. For security, this one's this one's actually um, kind of interesting too, because one of the one of the issues with moving to GitHub issues, one of the problems I say, well, you really call it a problem. One of the uh, one of the issues with moving to GitHub issues, let's stick with that, is that any security issue, anything with embargo level or highly sensitive material or data in it, can still come in through GitHub issues in a open way that was not available previously. So this opened us up for people to possibly get exposure to security issues that we don't want them to have access to or know about. Um, and the open by default team that des decided that, you know, for these security issues, uh, unless they had embargo level uh, security issues, like a customer could sue us or something like that, or a partner could sue us, frankly, basically, if it couldn't get us in trouble legally, uh, that we would leave them in GitHub issues, we'd leave them uh, open, we'd leave them searchable after they were, after they were resolved, so that people could go back and look at them. Um, and that, that was just a decision that we made. Anything that we do need to pull back that is embargo level, we will revert back to you. We have a private JIRA, a very small one for this right now that we will be uh, reverting back to using in those instances. But in general, the idea is, you know, we're working in GitHub issues. Our security issues will come in through GitHub issues too, and they will stay publicly visible so people can go back and reference them if necessary. Customer escalations also had to be changed a, a little bit as well. Uh, because we you know, aren't an open source project right off the bat. We are a, a company that, that, you know, sells ingestion and seats uh, and customers pay for customer support. Um, we have to have a way to, to integrate customer escalations into an open source process. Uh, so the way that we decided to do that was to keep, you know, all of the, uh, all of the, the process in place for the most part, but adapt it to the new channels, primarily GitHub and GitHub issues. Um, so we created templates for issues and feature requests, basically make it easy for a customer to come in and make an issue or a feature request, uh, make it easy for our global technical support team to do that for customers as well, or for an account team to do that for customers. Um, and we also provided templates uh, for common replies and routing for the engineers that need to triage these issues. Basically, we tried to make it so that our customer escalations could be more direct inside of GitHub uh, and also be addressed more directly by our engineers without having to do a bunch of toil and a bunch of work. Engineering work tracking was pretty straightforward um, because the instrumentation these engineers are going to be work on, working on would be open source and be working with GitHub uh, and GitHub issues. And the open telemetry project also works with GitHub issues. The best way for us to actually track engineers work across these projects is to, to more or less just use GitHub issues as well. So we shipped our engineering work tracking over to GitHub issues too. We also had to adapt some of our uh, management practices, um, notably the career ladder and performance analysis to better align with uh, the, the new work process and open source the engineers we're, we're gonna be doing, as well as you know, building in some, some timeline expectations to better align with the open source workflow. Uh, because you know, especially when you're looking at some of the projects that we're working on outside of our own like open telemetry, um, we don't always get to decide timelines, right? Um, things happen when they're ready. Uh, and then we we do the things we do often. So the, the management timelines that, that needed to be used as norms had to be updated to reflect that change. You know, if you're working on open telemetry, the timelines that you have may not be 100% solid, you know, 
90 days out, uh, six months out. It, it'll get more and more solid as you get closer to the date. So we update our uh, engineering management practice to reflect that so that people didn't get dinged for working on projects that were critically important to us. This one's a kind of a, I know that this one doesn't seem like it's a big deal, it seems relatively straightforward, but it's actually was kind of a big deal to some of our developers. Um, and this is single track development. Uh, none of none of our instrumentation team, none of our development would be done half in open source, half in closed. We we're going to be working all in the open all the time. Uh, having multiple code repositories is not acceptable. There was a, a bit of consternation around this, but overall, this was what the team decided to do, and this is what we implemented. Um, and honestly, I think it's a really a really good process and policy to have uh, to work in the open on your open source projects. We update our hiring profile as well. Um, prior to the open by default project, we hadn't emphasized open source development. It wasn't a thing that we had really prioritized at all in hiring. Uh, and we needed to update our hiring profile to align with that better. So we revised the attributes and traits that we look for in the new hire or in new hires. We revised the code challenge to allow candidates to demonstrate their ability to work in open source projects um, as, as opposed to our previous uh, code um, or coding challenge. So really just, change the emphasis of a hiring profile to people that had worked in open source and had um, knowledge of how to work in open source and it could show their contributions. And then lastly is the moderation guidelines. So we have a, a site called the Explorers Hub. Um, it's a forum for our customers, uh, especially developers, to learn how do I build with New Relic? How can I build on top of New Relic? Um, and users can post questions and answers, give feedback, you know, all the, all the normal stuff. So for our open source project categories in the Explorers Hub, um, we defined a process that detailed the expectations and norms for any questions that required engineering support, um, as well as a response cadence for those engineering teams so that questions wouldn't just sit there stale. So we went through, we did all this planning, we executed on it, we had all these changes, like were we successful? Um, with the initial July 30th launch, uh, yeah, I think it's an understatement to be honest. We, not only hit all of the instrumentation that we had planned in open source by July 30th, we hit it far before. And we actually pushed up the, the launch date a week to July 22nd, um, which was awesome. Like it was nothing anybody really expected until we started getting into it. And then you start seeing all these projects start clicking on like, oh, can I put the license in? Yeah, license drops in and it's open source. You know, they apply the template. Oh, hey, I'm ready to put the license in on the Ruby agent. Like, okay, do it, click. And now you have an open source agent. It was, it was cool to see that happen and just watch it accelerate up right up to the July 22nd date. Um, and it was really, really cool and really, you know, it felt great to be able to get it done early. It's not something you usually get done early doing something like this. But when you really think about it, how do you measure success beyond that launch, right? Um, the other major success that we wanted to look at was how well our engineers adopted to these new open source practices, uh, as well as how engaged the community was around our products that we open sourced. Uh, and to satisfy this, at least initially, looking at what we we're going to measure, we looked at the open source guide on open source metrics, um, which is, you know, the open source guides are developed by GitHub. They're super useful. So we looked at that and we implemented uh, a lot of the metrics that they provided. And the plan going forward is basically to baseline uh, and work towards improving every area covered in that guide. And the four areas that guide covered are discovery, usage, retention, and maintainer activity. So really make sure that we're doing well or improving in all four of those areas. Um, but by that measure, like, were we a success? Like, we don't know yet, right? Uh, I'm telling you what we did, um, not where we're gonna be at the end. We're still in the process. We don't know, we're still baselining. We're trying to figure out if this was successful and if it's not what we need to do. But having these metrics defined beforehand helps us identify when something isn't working um, with our policies and processes, especially, uh, so that we can take steps to remediate the problem. Uh, and that could be, you know, revising uh, a policy or a process. It could be providing additional training if we're not doing something well, if we're not training our engineers uh, sufficiently, or it could be taking it to a, you know, a, a project leader if there's a problems on specific teams to find out what's going on. All right. Talked with y'all for a while now. Uh, gone into probably more detail than you're, I thought I would or you really cared to hear, uh, but. You probably have one question like, great, so what? Like, why am I here? Like, why, why is this guy up here telling us about how New Relic open sourced their instrumentation? Um, especially, why is this marketing guy here, right? What's he selling, right? Uh, so I'm here today because uh, like, I'm a marketing guy, but I'm an open source guy first. Um, 
I think this story is important. I think these stories are important to tell. I think these stories are important for other people to hear. Uh, and I think that just our experience gives other companies, other organizations, other teams, like a way to start thinking about how they would open source code. So what am I selling you today? I'm not selling you new Relic, like our platform's awesome. Go try it, our free tier is great. That's not what I'm selling you though. I'm selling you on an idea. Uh, and since we're at all things open, I bet everybody here basically believes in it, but I bet a lot of you don't action on it. Uh, and that idea is that open source is important. And more importantly, if you have software that's good, it's useful, you should open source it. If your software is not a competitive advantage, but it's useful, you should open source it. The world runs on software. I believe, and we believe in New Relic, all the people I work with believe that, that to build a more perfect internet, like a better world, that we need to build better software. And that the way we can best do that is by doing it together. And that starts with each of us sharing, open sourcing what we can so that we all can build with each other's work so that we all can do better. So if it's not a competitive advantage, open source it. Like it's not simple. It can be difficult, but if we can do it, if New Relic can do it, you can do it. This is our story, right? Learn from us, do it better than we did it. Then come back and share your story with everybody so they can learn from you. It's not an exaggeration to say that, you know, soon, if we all start doing this, if we all take this mindset, if we all start open sourcing what we can, the open sourcing software isn't like a one-off weird thing at companies anymore. It's not a one-off hard, difficult thing to do. It's a normal everyday standard process for all of us all the time. So go out, look at your software and open source what you can. That's my ask of you guys today. All right. Thank you all. Uh, this is my LinkedIn, my Twitter um, up there. Also, there's a new relic, the sign up page. If you guys want to go check that out, it's pretty awesome to be honest. Uh, our free tier is quite generous. You should go try it out. It makes it seem play around with it forever. And also I added uh, a bunch of links to things that I referenced and related in here. I wrote a blog post that accompanies with this, the uh, published on Friday on the new relic blog. It's linked in here. Um, this whole thing, the blog post and this presentation was inspired, inspired by something that Adobe did a few years back. So I linked to their post on that, it's on Medium. And then there's just a bunch of links to other things that were referenced in this, in this presentation. So there's that for everybody. And, uh, and that's it. Um, thank you guys.